Hi, it's Mike Stevenson here. In today's video, um, I'd like to talk about the subject of connection hijacking within a low-code platform. So here we have um, an example of a typical low-code workflow platform where you can build um, workflows and agents and that kind of thing. And What's really common is it, it doesn't really matter what the platform is. There's a lot of these out there, whether it be um, things like Zapier, N8N, Power Automate, Logic Apps. There's lots of these low-code workflow platforms, and they all kind of have the same potential issue. So I'm going to just show an example of what this would look like here. So here I've built a really simple workflow. When somebody clicks the button, it's then going to create a message in Teams. And that's going to write a message over into a Teams channel here. Now, at a really high level, this seems really simple. Um, what really comes into play is how we create this connection to the Teams channel. So what would usually happen is the developer will come in here and it will configure this connection. And that will go out to Enter ID to get an authentication but that's going to require a consent approval where somebody's going to have to approve this connection. So this is where um, it's really important who these two users are and which the user is that you go to create the connection with. So let's pretend we've got a scenario where we have a developer who is also it's a small company. The developer is also an admin. So this developer creates the connection they do the approval, so that loops back through. We have a connection in this low-code platform now. Now, it might be the case that we end up having um, multiple connections for different workflows. And as we build these different workflows up, these connections are going to be in this project or workspace or whatever that platform calls the container these workflows come into. Now, the problem that we have here is these connections are now available. So if we've got a team scenario, my other developer can now come in and he'll create a new workflow here. And, you know, somebody triggers this and the connection will just pick up one of these connections we've already created. And that's going to write a message into Teams. So this, this is problem number one. When developer two over here comes in, triggers their workflow. Now, there are a couple of um, variations on this scenario, but let's, let's stay with a simple one first. So I trigger my workflow. I use my Teams connector, which uses one of the two connections that was created by developer one over here. So when the message gets written to Teams, it's going to be written in the context and it should show up as dev. One user has wrote the message in Teams because that's what you use the connections using. Now, a lot of the time with these connections, it, it also would have other operations available. So often they're quite generic connectors. So you'll be able to do things like read the Teams messages, trigger when somebody gets an alert off uh, when a team's message gets created create channels delete channels and that kind of thing so now if you think about taking this further and we go beyond just write a message developer two might go and modify their workflow and let's let's say we go and delete a channel now because they're using connection two here that was created that's under the context of developer one that means developer two can now delete a channel that only developer one has access to so here we've got a, a bigger problem that the connector can do more than just write messages now the same problem here is going to relate with multiple different types of connectors so teams is quite an easy one but think about things like what if i want to read and write to onedrive i'm now reading and writing to this other developer's account and I can maybe see files. And if that, that developer one is like a manager, I might be able to see files that, um, that that manager doesn't want me to see. So this is where the problem about connection hijacking is. This person over here created a connection in good faith, 
just tried to write a team's message and didn't realize that that connection they've created potentially in the right circumstances can be available to other developers over here who can leverage it and again acting in good faith can go and write the team's message they need or read the file but they're doing it under some other user's context now let's take this scenario a bit further let's say this platform you know let's say we're using Zabia for example we could be doing username password authentication into our Zabia account but this connection's using organization ID you know like a um like a working organization account to connect so suddenly we might have somebody compromises the password on our low code platform they can now come in and they can do everything developer two could do but they've got a connection available under developer one's credentials and they can start doing some quite um, destructive actions here if that developer one had significant privileges so there's a whole you know the, the, this connection hijacking problem brings in at least three or four different security vulnerability opportunities now what you know I, I like talking about azure so what i'm going to do is in the next couple of slides i'm going to move away from the generic problem which i think is consistent across many low code platforms and we'll talk about azure and how we can start um, you know firstly how the problem relates to things like logic apps and then how we can start doing something about this so here i'm in microsoft azure i've got my logic app and my developer creates a connection. So this would be the API connection. They want to write a message to Teams. And they have the same problem, the API connection. We need to authenticate as a user, which goes up to Entra ID. And again, thankfully on Entra ID, we've got this consent approval, which often needs an admin. So this will be kind of a backstop, potentially catching somebody using a connector that could be used in, in a manipulative way. Um, now, sometimes the, the admin might not realize, you know, they'll just go, oh, it's just Teams, yeah, let's just approve it. But really what you have to think about is, at this point, we've done the approval, we now have a connection running under dev one account, and that's, the, you know, the, this developer number one. And my logic app, again, will go and write a message in Teams that will show up as if developer one created the um, the message. Now, we've got this sort of scenario already here. So this is the one we've just talked about. But now developer two again comes in. And he creates a brand new logic app with new workflows. But he can just point straight to this existing api connection so he doesn't need to re-authenticate or anything like that he can just point to the connection that's already there and he can then write write messages to teams under this user's context and again the same problem comes into play where it goes beyond the user account so it could be things like um you know read and write to OneDrive. um you know, even other non-Microsoft stuff, you know, if you've got Dropbox or Gmail or something like that, you can, you know, when you share these connections, effectively I'm using somebody else's connection in my workflow and potentially getting an elevation, an elevated privilege based on the user who set it up. Okay, now, so the key question at this point is what can we do about some of this stuff? So the first one, and I think that's the most important, is don't use a personal account so when you're um, in you know, one of these third-party platforms or you're in Logic Apps, don't connect the connector with your personal account. Um, the preference would be use a managed identity in an app registration where you can. Um, obviously, that varies based on the, the system you're connecting to. Um, if you don't have a choice but to use a personal account, create a service user so this would be a user in your domain who doesn't belong to an individual it's like a shared team account or something like that and then you can give that that account very fine-grained permission so maybe you can only access this one channel that it can write messages into it doesn't have any permission to create or delete channels it doesn't have any of the other permissions that my individual account um would potentially have so we really zone that user into a very specific scenario so that that to me would be the minimum here now i think 
you know, the, these things here, this one and this one, this is where developer education is really important. We have to take accountability to not do this with our own personal account. Now, there's also, you know, that education piece from the admin side about when you're just consent and permissions, make sure you understand what the permission that is being consented can do, but also how it's going to be used. So if you're consenting it quite generically for some kind of platform, it, it might open up quite a few different potential attack scenarios. So I think this is where we need to really understand the big picture of what's going on and not just jump in and do an organisational um, consent approval. Now, one thing to also note that I think is quite good is um, systems like Power Automate do this quite well, where um, you can do things like act on behalf of a user. So this is where I can create my own flow. It can make it act as me through the connector, and I can have like a, a generic um, account, but it can act on behalf of another user. So we're seeing this coming into Logic Apps as part of the agent stuff they're doing, but this kind of thing's often already in Power Automate. And I think, um, you know, for this citizen developer scenario, Power Automate does quite a good job of being able to sandbox the flows so that often they're in your personal productivity area. But if you move them to a shared area in an environment, again, you need to be moving away from your personal account and make sure you've got this service user and where you can have some kind of act as, and if you can't ideally use a managed identity or an app registration. Um, hopefully this, this video kind of opens the, the door on connection hijacking, which I think some something that people don't think about when they're creating connectors in low-code platforms about how you actually just leave a door wide open for somebody to abuse your account. You know, let's think of the scenario, somebody uses my OneDrive account to read a file that's sensitive. Um, I've basically let them do that by creating the account. So really, you know, the, the accidental or deliberate attacker who accessed that file, I really left the door wide open for them to do it, whether it be sensitive, an HR related thing. Maybe somebody writes a flow that writes a message into Teams that shows up as if my account wrote that message and they wrote something really derogatory about another employee that gets me in trouble. Again, I left the door wide open for them to do that, so that's my own fault. And, and really, as a developer, I should be taking accountability for either one, being ignorant to the fact that that's a security vulnerability I left open, or two, not actually coming up with an alternative, safer way to do this. Um, thank you for listening to today's video. I hope this is um, interesting to people and have a great week.